as you study through the, Ma- uh, the book of Matthew, you will find that Matthew had so much to say about following Jesus. It's as if Matthew went to great lengths to make it clear to us so that we would not misunderstand what it really means to follow Jesus. I've studied religion most of my adult life and I believe that most of modern day religion is not even close to the religion of the Bible. So many people believe as long as you just make a commitment to Christ, as long as you just make a verbal commitment, some kind of profession of faith, you're saved forever. That's not even close to what Jesus would have us to understand. We notice this morning, Matthew chapter 8, verse 19 through 22, and we saw there are two different disciples mentioned in this passage. First, there is the impulsive disciple. Doesn't consider what he's doing. Does not really count the cost. Maybe it's off a fling of emotionalism that he would come to Christ. And when that emotion is gone, so is his dedication to Christ. And Jesus said to that man, the foxes have holes. The birds of the air have nests. The Son of Man has not where to lay his head. This man needed to understand that if he really followed after Jesus, if he's really going to follow Jesus, he may not fare any better than Jesus in this world. Jesus didn't want anybody to follow Him for worldly ambitions. Their number one goal must be heaven. Philippians 3 verse 20 Paul said, our citizenship is in heaven. John 14, 1 and following, Jesus said, Let not your hearts be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you will be also. Our citizenship is in heaven. We are pilgrims and strangers on this earth. And for those who want some kind of worldly advantage in following Christ, he's not interested in that. I remember years ago, there was an individual in a small East Texas town who left the Lord's church and went to a nearby denominational church and did whatever he had to do to be a member of that particular group. And one of our brethren asked him why he did such a thing, and he simply replied, business reasons. Jesus humbled Himself. Not only simply by coming to earth, but also living in depressed poverty. He was born in a borrowed stable, and He was buried in a buried tomb. He lived His life in poverty that those of us in the great U.S. of A. cannot even comprehend. He did that not only to humble Himself, but also to teach us a lesson about 
worldly wealth. Look at Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Verse number 19. Matthew 6, 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures on, heaven, on earth where moth and rust does corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust does not corrupt, nor thieves break through and steal. And then look at verse 21, Matthew 6, 21, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If your greatest treasures are material things, I don't care how much you come to church. That's where your heart will be. If your greatest treasures in life are material things, that's where your heart's going to be. Matthew 6, 21. Our greatest treasures must be spiritual things. And then we have the disciple who cannot come to Jesus till he does something else first. This guy doesn't have the zeal to be a disciple of Christ. He'll follow Christ, but he said, Lord, suffer me first. Permit me first to do this. Matthew 8, 19-22 he wanted to do something else first. He didn't have the zeal. Titus chapter 2, verse 14, Jesus gave Himself for us that He might deliver us from all inequity, that He might purify unto Himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Could it be, I'm just asking, Could it be we have missed something? Could it be our understanding of following Jesus is really not what it should be? I'm just asking you the question, is that possible that we could have missed it? You know, following Jesus, that even extends to your thought patterns. Matthew 5, 27 you have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, Whosoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. To really follow Jesus... We're talking about your mind. Jesus gets right to the heart of the matter. It's got to start in the mind. Proverbs 4.23 Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Matthew 12. Matthew chapter 12. Look at verse number 34. How can you, being evil, speak forth good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's the principle. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. An evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth evil things. You see the importance of the heart? In Matthew chapter 15, they're arguing about because the religious leaders are saying if you don't wash your hands in a certain way after you've been to the marketplace and rubbed around on all those filthy Gentiles, before you can eat, you've got to wash your hands just in a certain way or you've made yourself unclean. And Jesus is addressing that idiocy. And look what He says to them. Don't you understand in verse 18 and 19, 
Don't you understand? That's not what defiles a man. Out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, blasphemies, all kinds of sin. It all begins in the heart, in the mind. Jesus says, this is what defiles a man. But to eat with unwashed hands, that doesn't defile a man. He's going through all these ceremonies, all this religious stuff. You just attend the service and then act like the devil. Or you just wash your hands in a certain way and that makes you right with God. We're not so much different than they are. We just got a little bit different traditions, but our thought pattern is still the same. Just so you come to church, it doesn't matter how faithful you are to God, just so you're sitting in a pew so many times a week makes you faithful. Well, I'm going to tell you what, that doesn't make you faithful if you're up here every time the doors are open. There's more to being faithful than that. That's important, but that's not all there is to it. And Jesus is saying, don't you understand, to eat with unwashed hands, that's not what defiles you. What defiles you is when you have all this filthiness in your mind. That's what makes you mean and horrible. That's what makes you unclean before God. Not because you didn't go through some ceremony. Look at Matthew 5 verse 8 as he began the Sermon on the Mount. What did he say? Blessed are the pure in heart. So you could sit in a pew and not be pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. In Philippians 4 verse 8, Paul made it clear, Brethren, think on these things. And then give that beautiful list, whatsoever things are good, lovely, of good report, praiseworthy, honorable, good things. Think about those kind of things. Every day that you live on this earth, what are you thinking about? Are you critical? Are you thinking about ugly things? Mean things? Are you thinking about good things? Holy things? Things that edify? Things that are good and holy and honorable? Or is your mind on those kind of things? Following Jesus extends to your mind. And notice the dedication He demands. We don't, He does. He demands it. Look in Matthew 5.29. If your right eye offends you, pluck it out. Cast it from you. It's better if you have life maimed than if you enter into hell with all of your members. He said, or if your right hand offends you, cut it off. Cast it from you. It's better to enter into life maimed than to enter into torment with all of your members. Matthew 5, 29 and 30. I used to wonder for years. You know, somebody read that to me when I was a child and I thought, <laughs> what in the world does this mean? If your right eye offends you, pluck it out. Well, now think about that. What if your left eye offends you? You're just supposed to leave it in? Well, then we're going to have to pluck them both out. Then we're going to be leading each other around by the hand. No, we're not, because we're all going to have them both plucked out. Somebody in the world is going to have to lead us around. And what's it mean if your right hand offends you? What about the left one? What if it offends? Is that okay? Just leave it on, cut the right one off? It's evident this is figurative language. This is, this is not literal. Jesus is not saying... Pull your eye out. 
just say that you did pull out your eye because you saw something you shouldn't. That's not going to stop you from sinning. Suppose you did cut off your right hand because you did something wrong. That's not going to keep you from sin. That's not what the Lord is saying. He's saying anything that keeps you from God, get rid of it. A friendship? An association with another person? Anything that causes you to sin. Anything that leads you away from God. Even if it's not wrong within itself, get rid of it. Cast it out. That's the dedication He demands. That if anything gets between us and God, we have to do away with it. Even if it's not wrong. A mind that is pure and holy. Matthew 6, 21. Where your treasure is, there's where your heart's going to be. And anything that stands between you and God, it has to go. That's the point of Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. He says we're running a race. Well, are we running a race? Well, some of us ain't going to get further than this pulpit. I'll be one of them. Some of us ain't going to make it around the building. McCaleb can run six or seven miles. Most of us can't. But in Hebrews 12, here we are, we're all in a race. Well, is it literal? Well, I hope not. Of course it's not literal. We're all in a race together, running for this beautiful prize And he says, anything that gets in the way, the sin that so easily besets us, anything that hinders us, get rid of it. Cast it aside. Could it be the dedication and commitment that he demands Could it be we have somehow overlooked it in our lives? What did He really mean in Matthew 6.33 when He said, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. What did He really mean in Matthew 16.24 when He said, If any man would come after Me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Whosoever will save his life will lose it. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall find it. For what is a man profit if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Could it be that kind of dedication is missing in our lives? Have we become so formal and so ritualistic that these beautiful passages on dedication and commitment, we just kind of breeze by them? And even though we can quote them, have we really put them into our lives? Is Jesus and His kingdom number one in your life? That's what He demands to follow Him. To follow Jesus demands dedication and commitment. These two guys, well, Linda Anderson, how would you get in here? Have we let anybody in here? Good to see you, Don. These two guys in Matthew 8, 19-22, did you know they still got relatives in the church building here? You know these guys in Matthew 8, 19 through 22, did you know they still have successors in our world today? We still got people that just respond out of their emotions and don't count the cost for what they're doing. Might last two or three weeks, then their feelings hurt and they're gone. They didn't count the cost. And we still got people like this guy that he wants to follow Jesus, but other things in the world are first. 
Paul says, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. He's still got relatives, people that want to put other things ahead of Jesus and His church. To follow Jesus, He's got to be first. You've got to turn away from this world. You've got to turn away from your sin. You've got to give Him your whole life. You've got to be immersed to have your sins forgiven. And then the rest of your life doesn't belong to you. It belongs to Jesus Christ. You can begin right now.